G'day. You've probably seen in school lots of formulas for sums of numbers. For example, you may have seen a form for the sum of the first n counting numbers. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to however height you want to go, up to some number n. And this is given by the formula n times n plus 1 all divided by 2. And if you like, we can expand that out. n times n, uh, n squared divided by 2, that's a half of n squared, plus n times 1, that's a half of n, plus half of n. Great, so there's the form of the sum of the first n counting numbers. Or you may have seen the form of the sum of the first n squared numbers. Uh, two, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, as high as you want to n squared, turns out to be given by this formula. n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all divided by 6. And if you like, we could expand that out as well. We'll get uh, definitely n cubes on the top and n squareds and n's all divided by 6. In fact, if you do expand it out, you get this formula. Here's my notation. The sum of the powers, things raised to the second power, p sub 2, up to the number n, so 1 to the 2 plus 2 to the 2 plus n to the square root 2, that is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus n squared, is given by this formula. Third of n cubed plus a half of n squared plus 1 sixth of n. If you expand that out, you do get that. In fact, here's the sum of all the 1th powers. 1 to the 1, 1, plus 2 to the 1, 2, plus 3 to the 1, 3, or up to n to the 1, n, is indeed a half n squared plus a half of n. In fact, here's the form of the sum of the 0th powers. 1 to the 0, plus 2 to the 0, plus 3 to the 0, up to n to the 0. Well, think about it. 1 to the 0 is 1, plus 2 to the 0, 1, plus 3 to the 0, 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1, we're up to 1, n times gives me n. So there's a formula of sum of the zeroth powers, formula of sum of the oneth powers, sum of the tooth powers. Here's the formula of sum of the cubes, the th uh, third powers. Turns out to be given by one quarter n to the fourth, plus one half n cubed, plus one quarter n squared. And here's a formula of the sum of the first uh, n fourth powers. Bingo. Great. So I've written these formulas and you can go on and on and on. In fact, that's what the, today's video is about is you can go on and on. How? How do you go on and on? How do you get all these strange, crazy formulas? Whoa! In fact, I have to say, I think these formulas really are strange and crazy. In fact, there's something deeply mysterious about them. Uh, first of all, the one that throws me is if I take a general formula, uh, based on what I have so right now, there'll be a 1 to the kth power, plus 2 to the kth power, plus 3 to the kth power, all up to n to the kth power. It looks like the answer is always a polynomial in n, the highest number you're going up to. There's always a polynomial answer. And I actually find that deeply strange and mysterious. Because think about it, I'm doing exponents, I'm doing powers, these are really like complicated things, and yet, if I sum up all these powers, the answer is just a polynomial in the end? Wow, so I find this mysterious. Is it a coincidence we're getting polynomial answers, at least for the first, first five of these, or are they always polynomials? In fact, more goes on. If I look at the polynomials I've got, I've got an n here, I've got something in the n squares here, I've got something in the n cubes here, n to the fourths, n to the fifths. It looks like the degrees of the polynomial are always one more than the power I'm working to. If I'm working with the oneth powers, the first powers, degree two. Squares give me a degree three answer. Cubes give me a degree four answer. Fourths give me a degree five answer. So this is a polynomial of degree one more, k plus one, it seems. There's the next mystery. Is that really true? In fact, actually more. Look at that. Look at the leading coefficients. This is 1n squared. This is 1n, sorry. Half of n squared, a third of n cubed, a quarter of n to the fourth, a fifth of the n to the fifth. It looks like it's a polynomial. It begins 1 over k plus 1, n to the k plus 1, and then stuff. Okay, I wonder if that's really true. It's happening in these five examples. Is it always true? In fact, there's more. There's more. If you look at this, there's no constant terms. It always ends at n, at n, ends at n. Oh, I guess that ends at an n squared, ends at an n squared. But there's no constant terms. Always plus, always down to some stuff, maybe times n, and then nothing more, zero. Why is the constant term always zero, if this is true? Wow, wow. Actually, a bit more is true as well. It's kind of mysterious. The more you stare at these things, the more sort of unravel before your eyes. For example, look at the coefficients we get. We get 1n. So the first one for me has just a 1. This one is a half and a half. Oh, half plus half equals 1. This is a third, a half, and a six. A third plus a half plus a six equals 1. A quarter plus a half plus a quarter equals 1. A fifth plus a half plus a third, take away 30th, check it out, adds up to 1. Looks like all the coefficients add to 1. Whoa! Well, actually, actually, I can explain that one. If all this is that's going on here is actually true, then it follows that pk to the 1, that is the sum of all the powers, k powers, from 1 up to 1, would have to give the answer, oh, well, 1 to the k is 1. 
So if I put one in this formula, I should get one. If I put one in this formula, I should get one. If I put one in this formula, I should get one. Should get one, should get one. The only way I get one if all the coefficients actually do add up to one. So that will follow logically from that. Though actually there's another mystery about those coefficients. It's if you think about it, instead of doing the actual sums of the coefficients, you alternate the sums, go plus, minus, plus, minus. Uh, this one's a bit too simple, but look at this one. Half and a half, I'll go a half and then take away a half, I get zero. This one, third, take away, plus. A third, take away a half, plus a sixth. Uh, that it adds up to a half, take away a half, zero. Uh, this one, a quarter, take away a half, plus a quarter. A quarter, take away a half, plus a quarter, zero. This one, a fifth, take away a half, plus one third, take away negative a thirtieth. Check it out, adds up to zero. Looks like the uh, alternating sum of the coefficients is zero. So there's another mystery. Oh my goodness, a lot of mysteries here. Um, Actually, actually, the way you get the alternating sum is I actually put in n equals negative 1 into these formulas. I bet we're saying, if I put n equals negative 1, I'll get minus, plus, minus, plus. They'll give me alternating sums. The mystery is, if I actually were to put negative 1 into these formulas, which makes no sense in terms of summing all the numbers from 1 up to negative 1, you should get the answer 0, 0, 0. So there's my other mystery. All right, so... But the biggest mystery of all is, how do I keep generating these things and are they always sure to be polynomials? And then there's all these extra details I want to figure out and that is the theme of this video. How to get these formulas and why are they polynomials of degree k plus 1. Okay, let's do it. Okay, here's one way to get at those sums of powers formulas. It's all based on the mathematics of this very famous arithmetic triangle. You've probably seen this triangle before, but I assume we know the mathematics of this triangle very, very well. If not, uh, check out the URL below and we'll, if we go through it there. All right, uh, for starters, to explain the math we'll need, um, let me just uh, point out that I like to call the very top row, just that one entry, row zero. Let's start counting from zeros. This, in which case, this will be row one, this will be row two, row three, row four, five, six, seven, and so on. So let's do our counts starting from zero. Because when you do that, it turns out to be a very nice formula for any entry in the triangle. For example, this 35 here is on row seven. And actually, count how many places in it is, or it only counts as zero. It's actually zero, one, two, three places in from the left. So I claim this 35 is really the row number seven, choose number places in, three. That's the choose formula given by the factorial of the top number, uh, factorial of the bottom number, and then factorialize the difference. Seven takes away four, uh, three is four, four factorial. Which is very good because that four makes sense. I could have chosen coming from the right instead, counting at zero, zero, one, two, three, four places in from the right. Which case I'll do the seven choose four formula, don't worry, you'll get the same thing. So either come in from the left or come in from the right. There is a formula for any entry in this triangle. Great. Um, all right, so we have formulas for the actual entries. Uh, I need to point something out. Most people haven't, don't usually first see the triangle that way. They see the triangle from a different property that each entry in the triangle is actually the sum of the two numbers directly above it. So this 35 here is really this 15 plus this 20. But before I circle it, let me pause and say, but this 20 here is really that 10 plus that 10. It's that 10 plus this 10. Okay, but before I circle it, let me pause and say, well, this 10 is really that 6 plus that 4. But before I circle it, say that 4 is really that 3 plus that 1. But before I circle it, let me say that 1 is really that, that 1 plus that nothing. So actually, this 35 is really the sum of all those numbers. And people call this property the hockey stick property or the stocking property. Choose a 1 on, on the diagonal, come in along for a while, and after a while, turn a quick 90 degrees downwards, and you've got the shape of a hockey stick or a stocking. And it turns out the number in the toe of the stocking is exactly the sum of the numbers in the leg of the stocking. 35 does indeed equal 15 plus 10 plus 6 plus 3 plus 1 by that addition property of the triangle. All right, but let me write out that out, write that out. Because remember, 35 was the formula 7 choose 3. And this 15 is on row 6, it's already 6, and it's 0, 1, 2 places in. Plus this 10, row 5, 2 places in. Plus this 6, row 4, 2 places in. Plus this 3, row uh, 3, 2 places in. Plus this 1, row 2, 2 places in. So there is the stocking property expressed as arithmetic. All right, great. But actually, it's really good to read these formulas backwards. 
backwards. For example, let's start more generally, like uh, k choose k plus k plus 1 choose k plus k plus 2 choose k all the way up to some big number like n choose k but the stocking property is just oh one more and one more is n plus 1 k plus 1 bingo there is the stocking property coming from this arithmetic triangle the stocking property the hockey stick property great good grand that's what i want to use Okay, we're now ready to prove some sums of powers formulas. And we're going to use this stocking property over and over again. So in our work, if we ever see something like this, we'll say, oh, that's a stocking property right there. 4 choose 4 plus 5 choose 4 plus 6 plus 2 choose 4 must be, oh, one more, 7 choose 1 more, 5. Beautiful. Actually, let me point out one thing that could happen that's a little bit strange. I could actually have 3 choose 4 before this and choose 2 4 just before that and 1 choose 4 just before that. If you think about it, well, these coefficients here don't actually make sense. There's no way I can choose four items from a set of three, or four items instead of two, or four items instead of one. In fact, if I think about it on, uh, on the arithmetic triangle, if I'm on row two and I go four places in, I'm out in the empty space, the zero space of the triangle. In fact, people do decide that these are uh, coefficients have value zero. If the bottom number is bigger than the top number, assign that coefficient to value zero, which makes perfectly good sense how you interpret these things, and also makes sense you're out in the zero space of the triangle. So sometimes the stocking property might have extra stuff that's all zero, it won't get in the way, I promise you. All right, here goes. Let's derive some formulas. And just to be complete and thorough, I'm gonna start at the very beginning and make sure we derive everything I mentioned in this video. That is starting back at this one, the sum of the zeroth powers of the first n count counting numbers. 1 to the 0, plus 2 to the 0, all up to 3 to the 0, up to n to the 0. Great. No worries there. That's a 1. That's a 1. That's a 1. That's a 1. 1, 1, 1, all the way through. n 1s add up to n. There's no doubt about it. Our formula there is fine and good. Now we had the formula for the 1th powers and I didn't actually prove it earlier on. Let's do it now. Uh, the sum of the 1th powers up to n, 1 to the 1, plus 2 to the 1, plus 3 to the 1, all the way up to n to the 1. Well, of course, it's just 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n. But let me now be a little bit sneaky. Let's actually use the stocking property. Let's reinterpret each of these numbers as a binomial coefficient. Um, how many ways are there to choose one item from 1? One way. How many ways are there to choose one item from 2? Two ways. How many ways are there to choose one item from 3? Three ways. All the way up to how many ways to choose one item from n ways, n options? n ways. Beautiful. So our sum can be written as this sum of binomial coefficients, which is the stocking property. 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, n1 must be, oh, 1 more, n plus 1 over 1 more, 2. Great. And let me just spell it all out. This is uh, n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 all the way down to times 2 times 1 all over 2 factorial over the difference. Uh, n plus 1 take away 2 is n minus 1 factorial, which is great because it cancels out all that stuff. Grand. And I'm left with n times n plus 1 on the top divided by 2. Yes, that's what we had before. Beautiful. There it is. Now finally established. Okay, good. So, uh, the zeroth powers, the oneth powers, now it's time to sum those squares. Let's do that. Now things are getting interesting. Now I'm going to come at that in a very strange way. I'm going to do it by answering a question. Here's the question I want to answer. Let me get a pen that I think is going to work. Because my pens are starting to run out here. Here's my question. How many ordered pairs, how many ordered pairs A comma B are there with each of A and B from the set of numbers 1, 2, up to N. Right, there's my question. That's the question I want to answer. Now, um, ordered pairs, so it means something like a pair of numbers, 3 comma 5, or 5 comma 3, or 7 comma 19, or 102 comma 5, but all my numbers must come from a specific set of numbers 1 up to N. Um, I could, not as they had to be distinct, I could have 4 comma 4, or I could have 19 comma 19, that would be fine. But they are ordered. I'm definitely considering one to be first and the second one to be second. So how many ordered pairs are there if I have A being from the set and B being from that set, and one is definitely deemed first and one is definitely deemed second? Okay, well that's fine, we can answer that one, no worries. In fact, the very obvious answer would be just, well, okay, think of this. I have to choose an A. 
I, a can be any one of n options. So there's n options for the first number. B can be anything as well, any one of these n options. So there's n options for the second number. So n options here, n options there. I guess I've got n times n. n squared options at all means there must be n squared ordered pairs. Great. But here's the thing, I'm going to answer the question a second way, in a much more complicated way, even though we've got the answer right there, it's pretty simple, but it's going to be revealing. Here's my second answer, answer number two. So that's answer number one, answer number two to the very same problem. Now I'm actually going to kind of classify possible ordered pairs. For example, the, pair, the numbers here could actually repeat. I could have 5 comma 5, 6 comma 6, and so on. Or there could be just two distinct numbers. So I'm going to break my count down to two cases. Uh, so uh, uh, repeat numbers, repeat pairs, and non-repeat. I'll, I'll write it that way. So how many pairs are there with a repeated number? 1 comma 1, 2 comma 2. Oh, what I can do is actually choose which of these values do I want. I just choose one of these values and then use it by repeating it. I choose the value 7. Okay, 7 comma 7. No, 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 I choose, choose the value 9. Okay, 9 comma 9. So how many repeated pairs are there? Well, of the n options, I have to choose one of them and use that repeated value that will give me a repeated pair. Great, there are n choose 1 repeating pairs. Now, how many pairs are there of two distinct values? All right, I need to use two distinct values, like four and seven this time. I'm just going to choose two distinct values from that set of choices. Okay, so I'm going to choose two distinct values from that set of choices, like four and seven. But then there's another set of choices. Oh, I've got four and seven in my mind. Do I want four to be first or do I want four to be second? Do I want four comma seven or do I want seven comma four? So for each pair of distinct uh, two different values, I've now got two choices on how to make that pair. So, oh, so I've got two choices for each pair I choose. There must be two times n choose two options in all. And that covers all the types of pairs. Uh, so I've got this many plus that many. That must be the number of ordered pairs possible. Oh, okay, so I've answered the same question two different ways. Got two very different looking answers, but they have to be the same answer. This n squared answer has to be the same as this n choose one and two times n choose two answer. So I guess I've just discovered a little identity. That the, uh, va the value n squared can be written as that combination of coefficients. Aha! Because what I really want is not just n squared, I want the sum of all these square numbers. After all, p2 of n would be a 1 squared plus a 2 squared plus a 3 squared all the way down plus an n squared. So what I'm going to do now is actually rewrite 1 squared using this formula, rewrite 2 squared using this formula, 3 squared using this formula, so on and so on and so on. So 1 squared would be, oh, 1 choose 1 plus 2, 1 choose 2. Don't worry about that, that's zero. That's okay, that makes some good sense for us and it's still actually true for n equals one. For n equals two, I get uh, uh, two choose one plus twice two choose two. For n equals three, I get uh, three choose one plus twice three choose two, all the way down to actually using n, n choose one plus twice n choose two. Bingo, so the sum of the first n squared numbers is actually the sum of these coefficients, which I like because I'm seeing this column here is a stocking property uh, formula there. And this column here, uh, in fact, I don't even know that that's zero, but there's a stocking property right there. I am seeing the answer equals uh, these out to one more, n plus one, choose two, plus twice, uh, n plus one, one more, choose three. Bingo, p2 of n must be given by that formula. I have a formula for it, and I wonder if that's the same one we had before. I bet it is. But how do we see that? Let me just go through that work as well. So let's span that out and make sure we understand that that is the same formula from earlier on. Okay, so P2 of n is uh, n plus 1 choose 2. So that's going to be n plus 1 n over 2 plus twice, plus twice, let's try to be neat, uh, n plus 1 choose 3. So it's going to be n plus 1 times n times n minus 1, 3 of them divided by 3 factorial of 3 factorial is 6. Okay, so this is n, n plus 1 over 2 plus uh, n, uh, n plus 1 and n minus 1 over 3. There we go, 2 and 6, yes, one third. Um, if I were to expand this out, I'm actually not going to do it right now, but I can see it is cubic. And I get an n cubed term there. I know it's going to begin one third n cubed. Um, I can see it's actually going to have no constant terms. Everything's got a factor of n in it. So I know the last term is something times n. So it's something times n squared and something times n. And I bet if you actually checked it out, it will get the same answer we had before, which I can't remember what it was at the top of my head. One half and one six. I bet, just double check me on that, but that's just a matter of like a really grinding it out. 
it'll work. We've just derived the sum of squares formula. All right, okay, zeros, one, two. Only infinity more numbers to go through. Let's do it, sum of cubes. Sum of cubes, all right. Well, I'm really sort of getting to a general technique here because what I want to do for the cubes is really do the same sort of question here. Instead of answering a question about pairs, let's make it about triples. And triples will be A, B, C, ordered triples. There's a first, there's a second, there's a third, where each of A, B, and C are from the set of numbers one up to N. All right, so let's answer that question. How many ordered triples are there? All right, answer number one. The obvious answer is, straightforward way to think about that, is, well, there are n choices for A, there's n choices for B, there's n choices for C, make a total of n times n times n, n cubed options. Great. Answer number two. Here's the complicated way to answer the same question. By splitting this into all sorts of possibilities. Maybe there's only one distinct value appearing here, like they're all the same, 5, 5, 5, or 7, 7, 7. So maybe there's just one distinct value. One distinct value. Uh, maybe there's two distinct values, like 4, 4, 3. Okay, maybe it just involves two distinct values. Two distinct values. Or maybe the pair involves three distinct values. 7, 1, 19. Three distinct values. All right, so I'm going to actually count how many pairs, how many triples have just one distinct value amongst them, how many triples have two distinct values amongst them, how many triples have three distinct values amongst them, and the results, that must be the second answer to this question. All right, if there's only one distinct value amongst that triple, I've got to choose one distinct value to use. I need to choose one distinct value from n, and then just use it three times in a row. I choose 8, 8, 8, 8. Bingo. There's the n, choose one pairs using one distinct value. To use two distinct values, I need to choose two distinct values to play with. Okay, I need to choose two distinct values, like maybe four and seven. Oh, but then there's more choices. One of those values has to be used as a double, maybe seven, seven comma seven, and one of those has to be used as single. All right, so I've got to choose which one's gonna be single and which one's gonna be a double. So that's actually two choices there. Which of the two values I just chose is gonna be used as the single and which is used as the double? And actually, there's more there. If I suppose I used to choose, um, what did I say, seven and seven and four, so I used to make seven the double and four the single, then I'm gonna arrange them here. Where do I place that single? Do I place the single first, second, or third? And the rest of the sevens have, the rest have to be seven. So actually, there's three choices where to place the single. So once I've done that work and that, that choice and that choice, then I've got three more choices to play with. So there must be three times two times that many choices, that many triples with involving two distinct values. Three distinct values? Well, first of all, which three distinct values you want to play with? Choose three distinct values. Four, seven, and ten this time. And then, how do I want to arrange those three distinct values in three positions? Uh, I guess there's three factorial ways to do that. Three factorial. Bingo! The number of ordered triples must be this answer, uh, this value, plus this value, plus this value. That is n cubed. This one answer to the question must match this answer. n cubed must be n choose one plus six, n choose two plus six, uh, yeah, n choose three. Whoa! There, I have a formula for n cubed. I know how to write a cube number in terms of binomial coefficients. But now I want the sum of all the cubes. Here it comes. P3 of n is 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed all the way down to n cubed. All right. Let's not actually use cubes. Let's use the binomial coefficients. Okay, 1 cubed. Put 1 in this formula. I'll get 1 choose 1 plus 6, 1 choose 2 plus 6, 1 choose 3. Okay, most of those are 0. Doesn't matter. 0, fine. Now put n equals 2 in this formula, uh, plus uh, 2 choose 1, plus 6, 2 choose 2, plus 6, 2 choose 3. Okay, this one's got 0 in it right there. Th uh, n equals 3, uh, plus uh, 3 choose 1, plus 6, 3 choose 2, plus 6, 3 choose 3. n equals 4, n equals 5, and so on, all the way down to n actually being n. n choose 1, plus 6, n choose 2, plus 6, n choose 3. Getting scrawly, but I think I'm good because I'm seeing the stocking property right there. There's a column for a stocking. Here's a column for a stocking with zero up there. And here's a column for a stocking with zero and zero up there. And the answer is, it is, uh, this is with one, so it's n plus one and two, plus six times, this is uh, with twos on the bottom, so it's n plus one and threes, plus uh, uh, threes on the bottom, n plus one and uh, fours. The sum of the cubes must be given by that formula. 
And if you have the patience, you can write that out, expand it as a polynomial, you will find it is one quarter n to the fourth plus a whole bunch of stuff matching the formula we had before. Whoa, okay, okay. This is getting tedious, but let me see if I can see the general structure of what's going on now. What's, what's happening here? Because I had all those general philosophical questions about these things being polynomials of certain properties. Can we see what's going on now? I bet we can, I bet we can. I think the key is this question. This question's a good one. We did it for pairs, we did it for triples. Let's now be very general and do it for K tuples. That is, lists that have K entries. A, B, C, D, uh, up to somebody, I don't know, K. K of them, K of them. Uh, where each of the values A, B, C, et cetera, come from the set one up to N. All right, so, so I'm gonna ask that question two ways. So how many ordered K tuples are there with each entry coming from, a, from a, um, one of N options? Well, N choices for A, N choices for B, N choices for C, all the way to N choices for K, there are actually uh, N options K times in a row. I know that, well, I go, answer one is that it's N to the K. There are N, N to the K ordered tuples uh, following those conditions. Great. But here comes the second answer. Um, split into cases, where first of all, let's do the ones where all the entries are the same. There's only one distinct value, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Um, we have to choose which one distinct value we want to play with, and then just use it over and over again. Okay. Um, or there could be two distinct values. So choose two distinct values to play with, and then count all the options about where you're going to place, where those two distinct values can, how they can occur in this, in this, uh, in this arrangement. That's too little, too hard for my little brain. But let me just say it's going to be, but it's going to be some number times n choose two. And then the case we've got three distinct values appearing here. So that means first of all choose three distinct values to play with, and then do some clever counting. It's too hard for my number, my brain, but you'll get some number times n choose three all the way along to the case we're playing with k distinct values for k slots. Oh, how many ways can I arrange k distinct values amongst distinct values amongst k slots? There are k factorial ways. I actually know the answer to that one. All right, so I know that n to the k is going to be some combination of these binomial coefficients in this form. In fact, let me just uh, make it a little bit more compact. So uh, n choose one n choose 1 plus some number n choose 2 and so on all the way down to I know this actual number is going to be k factorial n choose k n choose k so I'm going to play with this so that means that means when I play my game of adding up all pa k powers p k of n is going to be 1 to the k 1 choose 1 plus a 1 choose 2 all the way along to k factorial uh, 1 choose k plus uh, 2 to the k 2 choose 1 plus a 2 choose 2 plus all the way along to k factorial 2 choose k uh, plus 3 to the k 3 choose 1 plus a 3 choose 2 all the way along to k factorial 3 choose k keep going down to n to the k n choose 1 plus a n choose 2 all the way down to k factorial n choose k great Stocking, some zeros, stocking, some zeros, stocking, some zeros, stocking. Add them up, add them up. I will get n uh, plus one, one more, plus a, n plus one, one more, plus, uh, plus k factorial, n plus one, k plus one. I have just proven that the sum of the k powers, one to the k, two to the k, up to n to the k, must be given by something of that form. This is magic. This is magic. It's also messy. This board is crazy. Okay, I think I can get rid of most of this now. I'll keep that general form there. But I think this actually now answers all my questions. And in the affirmative, in fact. Yes, everything I was suspecting could be true is true. Is true. All right, so let's be really clear. Let me write out this beastly thing by expanding it out. Here goes. The sum of the kth powers, 1 to the k, 2 to the k, up to the nth power, is going to be n plus 1 choose 2. Uh, n plus 1 times n over 2. Plus something times n plus 1 choose 3. n plus 1, n, n minus 1 over 3 factorial 6. Uh, plus more stuff, plus k factorial. n plus 1 choose k plus 1. Okay, I'm going to do it. n plus 1, n, n minus 1, down for a while. Um, over k 
plus 1 factorial. But let's think about what's going to happen over the difference over n minus k factorial on the bottom, which means it's going to cancel the n minus k factorial stuff up here, which means I must go down to n minus k plus 1. Aha! Aha! So this is n plus 1 times n over 2 plus a over 6 n plus 1 n n minus 1 all the way down to k factorial over k plus 1 factorial is 1 over k plus 1 n plus 1, n, n minus 1, all the way down to n minus k plus 1. Beautiful. P, k, n must be something of that form. It must be of that form. Well, look at this. Look at this. It's a polynomial. It's definitely a polynomial. Bingo, it's a polynomial. It's just polynomial that's got, that's got n squares and n's. That's got n cubes, n squares and n's. In fact, this is the highest power. In fact, I can see uh, how do you, oh, uh, this goes down to uh, n minus k minus 1. There's uh, k minus 1 plus 1 more plus 1 more. There's, there's, there's uh, n to the k plus 1 stuff there. The highest power of n is n to the k plus 1. Oh, oh, it is a polynomial that actually begins... 1 over k plus 1, 1 over k plus 1, n to the k plus 1, and then all the lower order stuff. Yes, it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial that begins with the leading coefficient 1 over k plus 1. Whoa! Whoa, 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 this is brilliant. Um, okay, I guess I've assumed that k is a little bit bigger than 2 or something like that here, because I want to make sure this doesn't get too, uh, too short. But if k is bigger than or equal to 2, if I've got enough terms going on here, I can see n, n plus 1 n, n plus 1. All the way along, every term has n, n plus 1 in it. So actually, my polynomial has a factor of n times n plus 1 times something. My polynomial is actually n times n plus 1 times something. Whoa! So what this polynomial is of degree k plus 1, it has n, n plus 1 as a factor. In particular, pk of 0 has to be 0. Put it in 0, get 0 times stuff. And also, pk of negative 1 has to be 0, 0. The alternating sum of the coefficients must add up to 0. And we've seen before that pk of 1 just has to be 1. The coefficients actually add up to 1. Ah, wow! Everything we've just said before that we're hoping was true is actually true. The sum of the kth powers, 1 to the k plus 2 to the k up to the n to the k, is a polynomial of degree n at k plus 1 with leading coefficient 1 over k plus 1 with all the coefficients adding up to 1, all the alternating coefficients adding up to 0. Bingo! There it all is. This is amazing. And there is no constant term. That was the other thing. I was trying to, my brain was racking around. What's the final term? Well, you see it's a factor of n, factor of n. There's, there's, no, there's, there's no constant term. It must end at a times n uh, and then 0. n is a factor. There is no constant term. Everything is falling into place. Whoa, whoa, and that is a means to calculate these things, which is kind of crazy and amazing and wondrous. You've got to kind of love it. So here's my challenge for you. Can you actually trace through everything we did here and go one little extra piece? Can you prove that the next term down, n to the k, then the stuff, a times n, can you prove that the second coefficient is always a half? Did you notice that in the formulas at the very beginning of the video, all the second terms had a coefficient of a half? Is that true in general? Can you prove that? That's kind of cool. Okay, so we've got the means to work out formulas for the sum of kth powers. Grand and good, but it's still pretty hard work. Here is a ridiculously easy way to crank out those formulas, and it goes as follows. Watch out, it's wild and wacky. Okay, start with the formula you do happen to have in your head. I had this formula in my head. The sum of the first n zeroth powers is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times is n. That I have in my head. To go from this formula to the next one, p1 of n, do the following. Multiply through by 1. So right now I've got n, multiply through by 1, I still have n. Okay. Then integrate this with respect to n, but ignore the plus c. Okay, this is kind of wild and wacky. What did I tell you? Wild and wacky. The integral of n is 1 half n squared. I want to write the plus c. Don't. Leave it at that. Leave it at that. And then add an n term so the coefficients add to 1. So add something times n so the coefficients add up to 1. Half plus a half adds up to 1. And voila, there's your formula for p1 of n. And you know what? It really is. That's the formula we had before. Whoa, whoa. All right, now I've got that formula to go from P1 to P2 then, multiply through by 2 this time. 
Let me do it. Multiply through by 2, so I get uh, n squared plus n. Integrate. All right, that's going to give me 1 third n cubed plus 1 half n squared. Great. Then add an n term so the coefficients add up to 1. Uh, third plus a half, that's 5 six. I guess I need a 1 six of n. <gasps> And there's your formula for P2 of N. That is actually correct. It's what we got before. Whoa, wowza, crazy, wild, and wacky. Let's do it one more time. To go from P2 of N to P3 of N, multiply through by 3. Multiply through by 3 gives me N cubed plus 3 halves N squared plus uh, 3 six is 1 half of N. Integrate with respect to N. Uh, one fourth of n to the fourth plus uh, or, uh, one half of n cubed plus uh, one fourth of n squared. I think I'm right there. And then add an n term so the coefficients add up to one. A half, uh, sorry, a quarter plus a half plus a quarter is already one. I don't need one. Zero n's will do. And bingo, p3 of n must have been, in fact, really was, n to the fourth plus one half n cubed plus one quarter n squared plus zero n's. Whoa, whoa, this is wild. And the wonderful thing I have to ask right now is, why is this working? This is actually a true fact, this will work. This is a wonderful mystery. See if you can figure it out, you gotta love mathematics.